I can focus on the truth and the good news even when life is difficult. And that's my challenge to you. What if, here, would you put these, I typed up just a couple sentences, but this is what I was thinking for us for Christmas. What if this was something that we just sort of said, you know what, I'm gonna pre-decide. The success of our Christmas celebration is not gonna be based on what's happened to us. It's gonna be based on what God's done for us. When that's our focus, we got something to celebrate, Red Rocks. We're gonna read one verse and, and, I, and I, we we're talking about this in between services. This verse is Christmas, right? This is it right here, Luke 2.10. It's why we're here. It's why we're still celebrating it 2,000 years later. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Can I just say, I know, I know what it's like to carry around fears and worries and anxieties about all kinds of different things. And I just want you to know that no matter what you are carrying, the message of Christmas is you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry because I'm here. Jesus said, I'm here. I got you. You don't have to be afraid of that thing anymore. I bring you good news that will cause great joy, and that is for all people. Good news, great joy, all people. You don't have to be afraid. I got you. Merry Christmas. Let's close in prayer. That's it, isn't it? That's it. And it's amazing, man. That first Christmas was amazing. And as much as I love that, there's part of me that starts to feel insecure because I go, well, man, that Christmas was amazing. I don't know that mine are all the, my Christmas is, lately it felt messy, a little more messy than amazing. Anybody know what that feels like? Like in your mind, I don't know if you're like me, I'm like Clark W. Griswold. I build Christmas up so big that it's never going to pan out the way I hope. Like I got so many dreams and plans for Christmas. Like I picture things like, like I have this, I have this scene in my mind sometimes and it's, it's me and Jill and our three boys in the morning, and it's Christmas morning, and of course they let me sleep in, and <laughs> the boys have presents, and I go, boys, you want to open your presents? And they go, no, Dad, let's keep talking about Jesus, because <laughs> you're so good at that. And I go, I know, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then I said, and we talk about Jesus, and then I have to, have to beg them to get, open their presents, you know, because that's just not what it's about for my family. And so <laughs> the boys start opening their presents one at a time, and as they do, Guys, it's, it's unreal. Like, they look at it, they look at me, this little tear, and then they hug me. They don't, they don't hug me like this. They hug me, and they look at my eyes, and then they, Dad, Dad, thank you. You're the best father in the world. And I go, I know. That's an amazing Christmas. I'm still waiting for that one. You ever build up Christmas so big in your mind, and then you... You execute it. it. wasn't quite what you thought. I was driving in my car this week, and I was thinking, like, what's my favorite Christmas? Like, the first Christmas was so amazing. Like, what's a Christmas that was so amazing that I want to go relive it each month? It was that amazing. And I'm sure I could come up with one if I would have tried harder, but I got to be honest, I didn't think of anyone. Any Christmases didn't come to mind. Like, I was like... All I could think about was some messy ones. And I was like, is that all I have? Do I just have messy ones? Um, like, I was thinking about, you know, Christmases when I was a kid. I used to get real excited for Christmas, but our family didn't have much money. And, and, and so at first, you know, when I was little, I didn't understand. And then as I got older, I realized, my gosh, my parents are doing the best they can. But what I, what I hated was the first day back at school when it was the what'd you get, what'd you get? And I was like, I don't want to relive those days. I don't want to go back to those. I was thinking about... Um, when me and Jill first got married, um, we, we were struggling financially because she was teaching sixth grade straight out of college at the, uh, at the church where, where, we, where we both went to church, and she was making about 15, 16,000 a year, and I was in a two-year internship making $50 a week, and so like, you know, we're, we didn't have much, and, and there's a, this awesome uh, couple in the church, and they knew, and they wanted to bless us, and so they gave us, they're like, voucher for a free hotel, you kids go on a date, and I was like, Done. And I thanked them, and they left, and then I looked at it, and I was like, it's in Milwaukee. <laughs> they gave us a free hotel in Milwaukee. So we had to drive an hour and a half from Rockford to Milwaukee. And I don't know if you've Googled, like, luxurious vacation spots in America lately, but Milwaukee won't be on that list. <laughs> All right, so we're in Milwaukee, and we're down, walking down the streets, and, and we start doing the window shopping thing, and my wife looks in one of the windows, and she's like, oh, that's so pretty. And all of a sudden, I was just heartbroken. 
because I knew, I was like, man, I, I want so badly to go in that store and buy her two of those, but I can't. I was like, I don't want to go back to that Christmas. I was like, well, you know, things are better these days. You know, what about the last few years? I started thinking about the last few years. I went, well, last year, that was a good Christmas. We had a good Christmas, great family time. Um, I was in, I just, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I just, I started feeling like this heavy, depressive, the second we were done open presents, I was like sad all of a sudden, and I just couldn't kick it, and, and I was so mad at myself because you've heard the songs, right? It's the most wonderful time of the year. You can't be sad today, and I was, so now I'm sad and feel guilty, so like, I don't know. It was just weird. I couldn't, I couldn't kick it, and so my emotions were off, and I just, I don't want to go back to that one, and I thought, well, okay, but the year before that, that was a good Christmas, and I was like, hmm, yeah, um, but that was the Christmas that I knew I had to tell my boys about my brain diagnosis. And so that was really messing with me the whole time. And so I was like, I don't want to go back to that one. And then there was a Christmas the year before. I was like, all right, surely that one was amazing. And I was like, oh, shoot. No, that's, that's the Christmas where my mom had just passed away in COVID. And uh, I started thinking about the times when, when the boys were little and she was always with us at Christmas. And I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to you know, be Debbie Downer, but I, in my mind all, all day, I, all I could think about was mom's not here and she, she won't be again. It was weird. So, um, so I, I started thinking like, are all my Christmases messy or are, are any of them amazing? Is amazing even, even possible? You know what I mean? You ever feel that? The title of today's talk, if you're taking notes and you know note takers get into heaven first, and if you're taking notes on Christmas, my gosh, imagine what you're going to get. If you're taking notes, I just saw someone go. <laughs> um, it's Christmas, messy or amazing? Christmas, messy or amazing? What I've realized as I was putting together this talk is I have, I have created some standards. I've never meant to, and I've never written them down until this week, and I was a little embarrassed to actually admit them. I've created some standards in my mind by which I gauge the success of our Christmas. And it didn't look very spiritual once I wrote them all out. In fact, would you guys put that up? Here, here's, here's my list. This is how I judge whether or not we had a good Christmas. And I know it is because it's what I say. It's what I tell people. You know the deal. In about three days, people are going to go, how was Christmas? And even if it was horrible, you're going to go, it was great. Forgive me. But I started listening. I was like, what do I tell people? I go, it was great. And then I go, I mean, we had this, we got together with the boys in the morning and we exchanged presents and gift exchange was great. And then we got together with family and, you know, sometimes family's mad at family and that can be awkward. But, but this year it was, it was pretty comfortable. It wasn't that awkward. Family got along and that was fun. And, you know, finances, not perfect, but I'm not making a lot of the mistakes I made early on when I would just rack up that credit card because I wanted to get Jill something that we could never afford. Like, I, I don't do that anymore. So finances aren't perfect, but they're not like a huge concern right this minute. They have been um, pretty comfortable, you know, we just had a good time. We didn't, have to, we didn't travel this year, so we were just comfortable. And, and honestly, my emotions were okay. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm kind of, and, and they were pretty good. So yeah, good Christmas. And I went, really, bro? That's what makes for a good Christmas? Did you not read the verse? It's good news that caused great joy that was for all people. It wasn't gift exchanges that caused great joy for all people. It's good news. And so I was like, maybe, maybe I'm looking through the wrong lens. You know what I mean? And you can look through the wrong lens at an aspect of your life. We're talking about Christmas today, but this is for your life. You can look through the wrong lens of one aspect of your life, and it won't just change what you see. It'll change how you experience life. If we look at Christmas through the wrong lens, it'll, it'll change how we experience it. I, have, I wear contacts. They're like big, hard plastic contacts, all right? I don't know if plastic, but I don't know what they're made of, but they're not comfortable. And it's why my eyes are red all the time. It's not because I live in Colorado, you know what I mean? And um, so... I go to the, uh, right now, these contacts are, they're jacked. They're jacked up. And it's my fault. Um, they're the wrong prescription. I can see like two miles down the, like an eagle. I can't see what's right in front of me. Like they are jacked up right now. And it's my fault. I chose the wrong lens. It wasn't her fault. I go to the eye doctor. Some of you guys know the deal. You sit in the chair and they bring in the thing. And the, she goes, one or two. And I go, mm, one. One or two. Two. One or two. 
I picked the lens. I told her what lens I wanted to look through. It's my fault that I can't see right now. But because I'm looking at life through the wrong lens, it's changing the way I experience life right now. It just is. And, and it's not just about how you see it. It's when you see it differently, you experience it differently. Let me give you an example. I was talking with our staff this year, and I was just being honest with them about some stuff. And I said, guys, there's been a little season of life where I have I've had kind of had a pity party for myself about my job. I felt overwhelmed. I I've, I've felt stressed. I've, I've almost dreaded certain aspects of my job. And here's how I've been seeing it. And I know how I've been seeing it because I listened to my words. I've been saying, I got to. I got to write this message. I got to come up with another point. I got to have a finance meeting. I got to go to this staff meeting. I got to talk to them about just the, just the way I was seeing it. I was feeling anxious going to work. And one day God really convicted me and said, no, 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 no. You don't got to do anything. You get to. And so I changed my words from I got to, to I get to. And look how it changed. I now would start going in the office going, I don't got to write a message. I get to talk to people about Jesus. I don't got to go to a finance meeting. I get to figure out how to buy another church to tell more people about Jesus. I don't got to, you see what I mean? One or changes things. So, so I started thinking, and here's, here's what's funny. The way I see Christmas, and I'm not, I guarantee I'm not all by myself here, but the way I, you know, kind of evaluate Christmas, here's what I realized this week. The first Christmas would have not passed my test, and we just talked about how amazing it was. It brought the Savior into the world. Like, it was amazing, but according to my standards and the lens I'm looking through, the first Christmas would have been a disaster. I'll show you. Here it is. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. She is like, right, it's time to pop. I know you shouldn't talk about Mary like that. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Told you. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. We've seen so many pretty nativity scenes and so romanticized this story that we think that was easy. And and I'm telling you, God said, because I'm bringing good news to the world, it's going to bring great joy and a savior. Like, it's amazing. My tests, let's run it through the gauntlet. Did they have a good gift exchange? No, they did not. <laughs> I know your, your nativity scene is lying to you right now, and it's got the wise men there with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Go look this up for yourself. They didn't get there for at least two years later. That nativity scene needs an accountability partner. It's lying to you. No gift exchange. It can't be a good Christmas. Family was none. You don't think Mary would have wanted a family member to be there with her, a a, a mom, an aunt, a cousin, somebody who's had a baby who could hold her hand and go, it's okay when that happens, you don't have to be scared, that's supposed to happen. It's okay, I got you, I'm with you, we can do this together, like, just breathe, just relax. Like, she's got Joseph, dude's never even been to a Lamaze class, (laughs) and good for him because I have and I can't unsee certain things, (laughs) just saying. Family, none. Finances, not good. He's a carpenter. Joseph's a carpenter. They're barely getting by. You know, you're not, you're not getting rich off that job, not where they lived. But one of the, one of the real signs, and I just learned this this week, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, I was reading in Luke 2, and I won't do it for time. You can, but it says when they took Jesus to the temple to be consecrated or, you know, like we, we do baby dedications. That's kind of what they were doing. They're supposed to sacrifice a lamb to God as an offering in this ceremony. Also, Mary, in the Old Testament law, Mary has to go and do some purification uh, sort of stuff, and there's a sacrifice with that. You're supposed to sacrifice a lamb, but the Old Testament law literally says, I read it this week, if you can't afford a lamb because you just don't have enough resources, you can get two turtle doves, and that'll be okay. Keep reading in Luke 2, what did Mary and Joseph bring to the temple? Two turtle doves. It's why the song says, Two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. You think the worship team wants me and they just don't say it? You know what I mean? Like they're afraid to ask. I don't know. It's interesting though, right? So we know that finances weren't good. Comfort, we don't even need to like 
Really? They walked 80 to 90 miles, at best rode a donkey. You know, we don't, we don't know if they rode a donkey. We speculate because that was a mode of travel that would have been used a lot for long trips, but we don't know that for sure. They walked, or at best, right before she gave birth, she rode a donkey for 80 to 90 miles. They had a baby in a barn, and they put their baby in a feeding trough. And I know that nativity scene that it's at home lies to you and tells you that that trough was glowing. It was not glowing. I fed horses for five years living in Kansas. I've seen more feeding troughs than I can count. They're the grossest things in the world, and they don't glow. There was nothing comfortable about this. And their emotions, we don't know, but I mean, we can guess, right? Like, these kids are by themselves and no family, and the only guess ends up being these Shepherds who, if you study shepherds, man, they were like the low of the low, the most untrustworthy people around, couldn't be more dirty. Like, can you imagine the germs? They came walking into the barn going, hey, you can hold the baby? No, you can't hold the baby. Look at you. Like, by my standards, first Christmas is a disaster. What's the problem? Because me and God seem to be looking at Christmas through different lenses, aren't we? I see Christmas as a mess, and he sees it as amazing, and, and I just wonder if he wants to challenge some of us to start looking at Christmas through a different lens. Here's the lens God sees Christmas to. Go ahead and put that, that big, big old thing up there. There you go. What did we say earlier? It's about good news that causes great joy for all people. It's the good news that causes the great joy. That's the lens through which God is looking. Put my standards up there. This is my lens. Oh, I'm hoping a gift exchange causes great joy for my family. I'm hoping some really cool get-togethers in my unstable emotions bring great joy for my family. Like when you see it, it's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? But that's what we do. We, 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 we almost like want to put ourselves in a timeout or punish ourselves because we went through the Christmas weekend and we didn't feel great joy. It's because we're looking to things that can't bring us great joy to give us something that they were never meant to give us. The best family in the world wasn't created to give you the kind of joy your Savior can. The best relationship on planet Earth can't give you the kind of joy Jesus can. No gift exchange can replace what our Savior can do in our soul. See, we're, we're putting unrealistic expectations on the way we celebrate a holiday and hoping that does something in our soul. And it's crazy. We gotta start focusing on the good news. And, and I, I did something that I rarely do. I looked up some of these words in the Greek and I can't tell you how many times I've been in church and heard a pastor go, let me tell you what it says in the Greek. And I'm like, really, bro? Who friggin' cares? That's what I think, okay? I'm gonna do it twice. So just deal with it. It just it got me this week, so forgive me. I looked up good news because it's the good news that's gonna bring the great joy. So I'm like, I want to make sure I understand what exactly are you saying when you say good news? And in the Greek, it's this. Go ahead and put that up. Not even going to try to say that word. But here's the definition. This is what's interesting to me. Refers to sharing the full gospel of Christ. That's the good news. It's not the family's coming to town. It's not look what I got or look what I could give. It's not how much I have. How are the finances? No, no, no. It's the full gospel of Christ that is supposed to bring us the great joy that's available for everyone that's supposed to change our lives here and now and for all of eternity. <laughs> have you ever, now you guys, can, we can be honest. Remember, we're, this, we can be honest. Have you ever heard somebody go, man, I just want to be at one of those places where they're preaching the full gospel. You go, Amen. Hey, Rick, what's the full gospel? Oh, come on. Some of you have. You know it. The full gospel is the good news, and I'm going to share the full gospel with you in three verses, and I dare you to take a picture of this screen because here's what I'm hoping. For some of you, you didn't even know why you are tuning into this service or came, but God knew. He's got a plan for you. He's trying to reach out to you. He's trying to change you and get a hold of your life right now. I'm telling you. But for, for a whole bunch of you, I want you to know how to share the full gospel because hopefully there will be a time when you're talking to someone you really care about and you're going, I want to help you put your faith in Jesus. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be trying to figure out what I'm supposed to share and not share because I don't know the whole Bible. But I got these three verses and this is the gospel, bro. You got this. You got life. Go ahead and put that up. Here it is. Three verses. Snag a picture if you love Jesus. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. That's where it starts. It's a recognition of I am a sinner. I just am. I have sinned, and I can't save myself. I need a Savior. That's where it starts. But the good news is, Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It says there's a cost. There's, a, there's something that we have to pay because of our sin, and the cost of our sin is eternal separation from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. But God said, I don't want that for any of my kids, so I'm going to give the ultimate gift. I'm going to send my son to die on a cross to pay the price for their sins so that they never spend time away from me. They'd be with me in eternity for eternity in heaven. You know the deal. I said it backwards, but you get it in heaven for eternity. He said, that's what I want. That's what I got for you. That's why I sent my son. Who qualifies? Romans 10, 13. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Listen, that was one of the hardest things for me to do. I sat in a church when I was 24 years old, just had been suicidal and had no direction in life. And I heard somebody preach good news. And I thought, I really, really want that. But who am I kidding? I'm just me, and I mess up everything. I can't be like these people. I can't be good enough. God won't want me. I'll screw it up at some point. I didn't realize I don't have to be good enough. It's not about what I can do. It's about what Jesus already did, and it is available to everyone. Everyone who calls on his name will be saved. Bring you good news that will cause great joy. This one... The only reason I was like trying to look stuff up in the Greek, because I was like, I wanted to like try to try to get it. Like, what is God saying when he says great joy? Because that, you know, what, what to God is great joy? Because sometimes I'm like, I got a little joy. Mm, I'm all right. Not awful. What's great joy in God's eyes through his lens? So I looked that word up. Great. It's the Greek word megas. It's where we get our prefix mega, like megastar. And here's the definition, and this so intrigued me. In the widest sense, exceedingly great, greatest. Leave this up for a sec. In the widest sense. Okay, who said this? God is saying this through an angel to some shepherds. So then it made me go, okay, well, what to God is the widest sense? Like maybe through my lens, do I see the widest sense? Possible? Do I see that different than God does? That's what I started thinking. And I'm like, when I think of something, you know, wide, I think of like my truck in the Starbucks drive-thru. It's just annoying. But I'm from Kansas, and I had to put a lift kit on it. That's what I do. I was walking out in this parking lot this week um, one night, and I was the only one here. And I looked up, and the big Red Rocks logo was glowing. Some of the lights were on around the building, and. I honestly stood there in amazement. I don't know why I, I come here all the time, but this night I was like, wow, that, that's a big building. Praise God for what we get to be a part of. Like, the thing's wide. Look at that thing. And I thought, no, 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 it's way wider. It's wider than that. It's like the, our country is so wide. Like, if you've ever driven from California to Florida, you're like, yeah, that sucker's wide. What's wide to God? Because he's talking about the type of joy that is accessible through his son, Jesus. And so I started Googling some really weird things, trying to grasp what does God see when he says the widest possible? This is, this is funny. One light year, I know this is weird, just stay with me. One light year is 5.8 trillion miles wide. My brain's already broke. I can't figure that out. What's 5.8 trillion miles you know what I mean? Okay, that's, that's one light year. The Milky Way, our galaxy, I looked this up, is approximately 100,000 light years wide. So 5.8 trillion, take 100,000 of those. I can't even figure this out. I don't even know how to write that. That's one galaxy. I read this week that scientists think there's somewhere around 2 trillion galaxies that we can see. Okay, you start to see what I'm saying? When God says, I have the widest joy in store for you, he's talking about a joy that we can't hardly fathom. He's talking about a joy that supersedes my tough situations. He's talking about a joy that comes from in here, from him, that allows me to go through things I never thought I could make it through. 
because it doesn't make any sense. You can't walk through that and have joy unless Jesus is the source. There's not a situation in this world that can give us joy, the, the vastness of the joy that God wants to give us in our soul. He said, I got good news. I'm bringing this crazy kind of joy that you can't fathom. Who's it for? All the people, everybody. No matter what, no matter who, this is for you. It's, I'm talking, this is for you. The one sitting at home going, you can't be talking about me because you don't know how, how bad I've been. It's for you. The one sitting in church right now going, I could never do what these people do. I could never, I'd be a hypocrite. I could never keep this act up. It's not for me. I got too much baggage. It's for you. No matter what you've been through, no matter how long it's been, no matter how bad it's gotten, God is calling out to you right now, saying, I got such good news. It's going to change your life. It's going to forgive your sins. It's going to put my spirit inside of you. It's going to give you heaven forever, and you're going to walk with a new purpose, and attached to that new purpose is a joy that you can't get anywhere else. I got something for you. According to Luke 2.10, that first verse we read, good news, great joy. All people, the more we start to receive and focus and fixate on that, the more amazing everything becomes, even on the hard days. Now, listen, that's easier said than done, to be honest. Because I know, so I'm going to try to stay composed as I say this, I know what some of you have been going through. And you would love nothing more this Christmas than to focus on good news, but your mind is like overwhelmed with some tragic things that you've been through, with some things that your family's been through. It's so hard to even fathom celebrating Christmas because you got this relational thing going on. You got these family dynamics and people who are supposed to be there aren't. You don't know what to do. It's not the same. You got financial issues that feel just overwhelming. So for some of you, it's there's an empty seat at Christmas. And I know, because I've done some of the funerals, I just want to say I'm sorry. And I believe God's grace and his mercy can get you through anything, including what you're going through right now. Jesus said, both of these things are true at the same time. You will have troubles, and I've overcome them. And let that bring you a little bit of peace. That's what he said. In fact, before we even go on with the message, would you guys, can we just, as a church family, can we, can we together pray for the people in our church family that are really struggling? Uh, Christmas is awesome, but you know when you're really struggling, sometimes it highlights some struggles. C can we pray for some, some of our family members? Let's pray. God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you, you gave us this thing we've never even earned, this opportunity for salvation that we don't deserve. And so we get excited to celebrate him this time of year. But God, you also know that pain is real. And there's times when we all go through it. Some of us right now are going through it in ways we don't know how we're going to figure this thing out. So God, I just pray. Your word says that we can step into your throne room of grace with confidence. And then in our biggest time of need, we'll get grace and mercy. And that's what I pray. I pray grace and mercy over these families and these individuals in Jesus name. I pray you would remind them every second, if necessary, that you're with them every step of the way, that you'll never leave them and never forsake them. And if necessary, you'll carry them through the valley of the shadow of death until they get to the other side of this thing. Thank you, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, thank you for letting me do that. Um, when I started putting this talk together at the beginning of the week, I uh, thought, what I really want to do is I want to help you be better at something that I struggle at, which is I've been looking at Christmas through the wrong lens. The truth is, I look at a lot of my problems in life, though, through the wrong lens. And I want to help you avoid that this year. I want to avoid that this year. 
So here's my goal and my prayer for you is that today, before Christmas morning arrives, we pre-decide, oh, I'm going to have an amazing Christmas. It's not going to be because of my situation. It's going to be because of my Savior. It's not going to be because of how we celebrate. It's going to be because of who we celebrate. And he said he can get me through anything, and with him, nothing is impossible. So we can do this. Now listen. I've been telling God all week, I'm going to have a good Christmas. But here's the truth. I don't know what's going to happen with the family. I don't know how that's all going to turn out yet. I don't know if anyone will like the gifts I got them. I don't know how tired I'll be or where my emotions or mental health will be. I don't know yet. Unless God does a miracle, I'll still have a brain disease and my mom won't be there. But see, I've decided. It's not about my situation. It's about my Savior. And I can focus on Him even when it hurts. We can do hard things. I can focus on the truth and the good news even when life is difficult. And that's my challenge to you. What if, here, would you put these, I typed up just a couple sentences, but this is what I was thinking for us for Christmas. What if this was something that we just sort of said, you know what, I'm gonna pre-decide. The success of our Christmas celebration is not gonna be based on what's happened to us. It's gonna be based on what God's done for us. When that's our focus, we got something to celebrate, Red Rocks. And that's what I want for you. And listen, as you could already tell, this is not just a talk about Christmas. This is about life, but it definitely applies to us this weekend. So the challenge is, God, help me to see my issues, my life, my potential, my future through your lens. Help me to focus more on what Jesus has done for me than what has happened to me. And help me to be a light and pass that on to everybody around me in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand up with me? Let's pray. God, I thank you for your son again. I'm going to keep saying it all weekend. Thank you for Jesus. We've never deserved him, never earned him. But thank you because we can have our sins forgiven. We can go to heaven and be with you. And we can have your spirit that helps us get through things we never thought we could get through. I just say thank you. Church, I want to give all of you a chance to respond to whatever God might be doing. I'm going to ask two questions with everyone's head bowed and eyes closed. The first one is this. You go, yeah, Christmas is uh, the most wonderful time of the year. But if I'm honest, this Christmas isn't, doesn't feel that way. Because me or my family, man, we're going through some stuff. We've been through some stuff. Some, some tragic things have happened. Some scary things are happening. And you would say, this Christmas, I need an extra portion of God's grace and mercy to get us through this. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'm just going to pray for you. Yeah, it's real. It's real. Second question is this. You don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. All this good news I've been talking about, to you it's a theory. It's an idea. It's something other people say they've experienced, but you haven't. But you can just tell. Like there's something going on in your heart, something going on in your mind right now. You can just tell. Like I think God's trying to get my attention right now. And you just know it. Like, and this is my moment. I'm going to ask him to forgive me of my sins and be part of my life. Because I do want to go through life with His Spirit, with His presence, and I do want heaven forever with Him. So tonight, I want to say yes to Jesus. If that's you right now, raise your hand. I want to say yes to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Praise God. God, I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now in Jesus' name. And God, I pray for anyone who is struggling right now, that they would be able to see your light in the middle of what feels like darkness. I pray that they would feel your presence, feel your grace, feel your mercy, find themselves surprised by the level of peace and joy they're able to walk in when you take what they're dealing with into effect, into account. I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you have a plan for us. And God, it is our honor on this Christmas weekend to worship you with music in Jesus' name. And everybody said...
Bedrocks, I love you so much. Merry Christmas. Let's worship.